Federal prosecutors have been ordered to pursue the toughest possible sentences for criminal suspects. U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions issued a memo May 10th rolling back Obama-era reforms that eased sentencing for some nonviolent drug offenders. Anthony Papa is the manager of media and artist relations for the Drug Policy Alliance. Papa says Sessions' reinstatement of harsher sentencing policies will destroy families because the breadwinners will be locked up for extensive periods of time. Not only is going to put people with drug problems away that should be treated medically, not punitively, he's going to affect many family members of those that are being incarcerated. The National Association of Assistant United States Attorneys says the policy will, quote, restore the tools that Congress intended to punish drug suspects. For United News International, I'm Neela Uni. Welcome once again to the radical imagination. I'm your host, Jim Bredos, and I'm a sociologist at John Jay College. We'll get to our guest, Anthony Papa, in just a couple minutes. But first, the decades-long drug war in America has been an unmitigated disaster, a catastrophe for the country and for millions of people affected. However you want to categorize the war or measure its results and consequences. Over the past four decades, federal and state governments have poured over $1 trillion of tax money into a wasted effort. In 1980, the United States had 50,000 people behind bars for drug law violations. Now we have more than a half a million. The United States is the world's largest jailer. Drugs remain widely available and treatment resources are scarce. The money funneled into drug enforcement has meant dramatic cuts and defunding of other important services. Less resources for more serious crime and essential education, health, social service, and public safety programs. The drug war should be seen as an intentional and institutional war of structural violence on the most vulnerable, oppressed, and marginalized communities both here and abroad. State violence, specifically hyper-militarized policing, is more dangerous for poor people than the drugs themselves. The most potential negative impact or consequence on poor people is the police, not the drugs. And it's helped to create a cruel and brutal world based on fear, vengeance, humiliation, shame, and violence. The human cost and destruction of people's lives here and around the world is incalculable. Today, our guest on the Radical Imagination is an activist, writer, and artist who has been involved firsthand in the system, returning home after serving 12 years of a 15 to life sentence for a nonviolent drug crime sentenced under the mandatory provisions of the Rockefeller drug laws of New York State. He became the first individual in New York State to receive both a clemency under Governor Pataki in 1996 and a pardon under Governor Cuomo in 2016. He's the manager of media and artist relations at the Drug Policy Alliance, an organization devoted to shifting funding away from the same old, same old failed policies and toward effective drug treatment and education programs. He's written eloquently of his riveting story in life in a recent highly praised book entitled This Side of Freedom, Life After Clemency. And we'll be welcoming Tony Papa to the Radical Imagination in just one minute. We have another short clip of Tony. Well, less than a month after calling New York City soft on crime, Attorney General Jeff Sessions was presented with an award from the NYPD Sergeant's Union today. Okay, it's there that he announced his new policy to crack down on drug offenses. Here's Jen Lammers. Throwing the book at our nation's drug offenders in a dramatic reversal of Obama-era policy, Attorney General Jeff Sessions demanding federal prosecutors ask for maximum sentences on drug crimes. I have given our prosecutors discretion to avoid sentences that would result in an injustice. This is 
a key part of President Trump's promise to keep America safe. Sessions detailing a memo he sent to U.S. attorneys, which also sets mandatory minimum sentences for drug offenders. While supporters say the new policy is aimed not at low level offenders, but at drug traffickers and dealers. These are the kind of people we want to keep off the street. This is something that President Trump takes very seriously, and certainly Attorney General uh, Sessions. And I'm happy that we're finally going to go after people who are trafficking the most dangerous narcotics that are plaguing not only Staten Island, but everywhere in New York City, if not the country. Critics argue it would only add to an overloaded prison system. Former Attorney General Eric Holder, who led drug policy reform in 2013 by directing prosecutors to look at circumstances before charging defendants with drug crime. Calls the move dumb on crime and ill informed. Anthony Papa agrees. He served 12 years in prison for a non violent drug offense before then Governor George Pataki granted him clemency. They tried that in New York with the Rockefeller drug laws. When the laws were enacted in 1973, it was to capture the drug kingpin and to curb the drug epidemic. It didn't either. It locked up low level non violent drug offenders where uh, all prisons in New York burst at its seams. Several other critics, Charles and David Koch, who today came out opposing the plan, saying a more effective measure would be to change existing federal laws. So, Tony. Thank you. Welcome. Well, here we are. Here it goes again, right? Yep. Thanks so for having me on. Thank you for being here and give us a little background to your own experience under the Rockefeller drug laws and what seems to be political efforts to return us to those sorts of days again. What was your situation? In, 19, what happened to in you? 1985, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I got involved with drug activity. I bowled in a league in Yonkers, New York, and I kept coming late. And then my bowling partner said, why do you keep coming late? My car broke down. Why don't you fix it? I have no money. Yeah. You want to make some money? How? He introduced me to another individual who I found out he was dealing drugs in the bowling alleys in Westchester County. At first, he came to me. I, I knew what he was doing. I said, I don't want to be involved. A few months passed, Christmas time, I owed rent, uh, my, I was, had a fight with my wife about money, mm. and I got desperate. When you get desperate, you do stupid things. So I get a call, the same guy, you want to make some fast money. Okay, what do I have to do? Like the carrot dangling on the string, I, I went for it, uh, I brought an envelope containing four ounces of Coke from the Bronx to Mount Vernon, Mm. I walked into a police sting operation. 20 mm. cops came out of nowhere. It was a setup. Set up. Yeah. I was placed under arrest. Mm. Uh, I did everything I could do wrong. And the judge sentenced me as a first time nonviolent drug offender to two 15 to life sentences. You've never been in trouble? Never, never. So two 15 to life terms. 1985? 1985. Okay. Went to Sing Sing Prison. Mm. Totally changed my life forever. Uh, became prisoner number 85, 8, 28, 37, was lost, didn't know how to survive. Uh, how old were you? Uh, 29. 29. And then, uh, you know, what was helped me survive the prison experience was my discovery of art. Because pr prison is the most existential uh, environment there is. And what I mean by that, there's something mystical spending 15 years in a six by nine cage. The judge eventually gave me a break because I was a first time offender and sentenced me to one 15 life sentence. Mm. So there I was lost until I met an individual who was a prisoner who was an artist and he, he turned me on to art. And uh, one night I was, uh, I smelt uh, uh, turpentine and I went out of the cell and followed this, the odor Mm. And it went around the tier of the, of, uh, of, the, of the block. And then it went to a cell, and I looked in the cell, and I saw all these amazing paintings, like Rembrandt. Huh. And it was a guy painting, and, you know, he turns mm. around, he comes out, he opens the cell door, and he says, why are you looking at my cell? Mm. So in prison, there's certain rules you have to follow. And uh, in the beginning of the imprisonment is the most dangerous time, because you have to learn. Everybody's how to testing you out. There. Or yeah. you have to learn how to do time. Uh, Okay. So one of the rules is, you, you, you know, it's a disrespect to look in somebody's cell. Right. I didn't know about disrespect and where it, right. it fell in the, the, the tier of, you know, existence in prison. Yeah. But he told me, and I said, look, I don't want to fight with you. I'm just admiring your work. I think you're a great artist. And at that point, his head blew up. You got a big head. Oh, you like mm. my work. And you ever paint before? 
I says, no, he says, you want to try it? He gave me some watercolor brushes, some paint, went in my cell overnight, stood up all night, painted the worst painting you ever saw, mm -hmm. but it ignited this flame in myself to become mm. an artist. And that's mm. how I began my, 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 uh, my, my big doing, you know, get into my art. And uh, about and help you do time. Help me do time. Obviously. Transcend, transcend to, the negativity. To transcend what was happening to you. And, and give your me survival. And there, give yeah. meaning in my life. Meaning, Again, right. And that's what you mm -hmm. need in order to survive imprisonment is uh -huh. find meaning in your life. Right. At the same time, I went to school. I, my art, I got a couple of degrees. I got a master's degree from New York Theological Seminary. I studied liberation theology. And two bachelors. Two bachelors. Years. And then when one, they did have classes. When in they prison, had. When they had. When they, uh, 1995. They right. took away educational programs in prison. Right. It, despite mm. surveys that said, Absolutely. you know, the more education someone got, the less they would do the re go back, right with, recidivism right. back into the prison system. Much so lower. Absolutely. In 1988, I was sitting in my cell one night. I picked up this mirror, looked in the mirror. I saw an individual who was going to spend the most productive years of his life in a cage. Picked up a canvas and I painted this self-portrait entitled it 15 Years to Life. Seven years later, it wound up at the Whitney Museum of American Art, and it reached the ears of the governor, and I actually Now, there's an interesting story of that. So this is a self-portrait of you holding, holding your head. Holding my head. Yeah, this it, is, by the way, the new book. It's, it's, that on, you just, it's on the cover of my new book. It's on the book. cover of the new book. 15 to Life. You're it's, holding your uh, head in your hands here. Right. And the Whitney Museum, how did the Whitney Museum eventually get this? I was running the art program at the time in Sing Sing. The art instructor died, Ed Kleber, and, huh. the, and, the, and this uh, civilian who ran the uh, programs, Dennis Man Warren, came up to me and he said, look, you know, look, uh, you want to run the program? I said, sure, I'll, vo I'll volunteer, and I started running the art program. One day, he came up to me and he gave so me So you a, became the teacher? I became the teacher. For the other other prisoners, prisoners I had a class right. maybe 15, 20 prisoners at one time. Hmm. A waiting list. It was it was run by myself, and it was it was amazing how what I saw yeah. the power hmm. of art. Where hmm. let's say for existen, a, example, there was these two prisoners that ran rival gangs in the blocks in in Sing Sing, and they used to stab each other. Well, after a month in hmm. my class, they were painting each other's portraits hmm. instead of the violence that they were, mm, were doing to mm, each other. Mm, mm, so I saw the transformative power of, of art. It, it, was, it was amazing. Well, he gave me, Dennis gave me this letter. It was from the Whitney Museum of American Art. And they wanted a borrow painting from a prisoner in, in Sing Sing. Uh -huh. So yeah. he says, do you want to... To show one of their exhibitions. He wanted right. to show in, 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 in a retro, uh, retrospective of Mike Kelly, which was this famous artist from, a conceptual artist from uh, LA. And I read the letter, I says, wow. I says, this is my freedom. I'm gonna paint my way to freedom. And you know. What I, do you mean by that? You were I was gonna hoping, use my art in right. some way. Okay, so the Whitney would, would see it free. and then yeah, I, people somebody, would say, wow, this th guy yeah. is. Yeah, uh, and then I, my idea was really to get neat. clemency yeah. from the governor. I see. This was all a plan. And basically, it happened. Yeah. You know, people thought I was crazy thinking I was going to paint my way to freedom. And so my work uh, was shown, my, my self-portrait was shown in an installation called Pay for Your Pleasure. And the concept of Pay for Your Pleasure, which was exhibited all all cap art capitals around the world, it was a huge installation with 10 by 10 foot uh, portraits of famous novelists, poets, thinkers, minds of, great minds of our time. And you walked in, you had two collection of crime collection victim boxes where you make a donation. And you walk down these long 20-foot corridor and look and, and you read these quotes from, you know, these famous people. And at the end, in the middle of uh, the installation, before you left it, you would see my self-portrait, mm -hmm. 15 to life. And uh, it, it was an amazing experience for me. Now, t they characterized you, the artist. They didn't use your name. Well, but what, now, what did they say what, what you had done, the which was also increasing the titillating possibility of business for the Whitney here? What so, had happened yeah. was when uh, I, I was 
chosen to be in the show. Right. I gave photographs of the art to the Whitney because slides were not allowed. Okay. Because they thought you could cut somebody's throat with a slide. Okay. And this is the thing I had to deal with being an artist in prison. If you t take any typical art catalog uh, that was uh, available, 90% of the supplies you couldn't get because it was considered contraband. Yeah. You couldn't get any so. brushes that were sharp because you use as a weapon. You couldn't get uh, oil paint uh, because you could make a bomb to blow somebody up. Huh. Turpentine. So it was so hard. So what you use? What'd you well, use? acrylic paint, okay. watercolors, uh -huh. and then whatever I could get smuggled in by the correctional officers there, I used to actually do portraits for them of their loved ones, and they would smuggle in you know, the oil paint. Uh -huh. But what, what had happened was when, when uh, the Whitney, it was supposed to be shown at the Whitney, and then I got a word from this clerk that was uh, Dennis Van Warren, the civilian who ran the program, uh, his clerk says, there's not going to be a show. I said, what do you mean? He says, you better go see Dennis. So I went to see Dennis. He was in his office. He's writing on his desk. And I said, Dennis, I heard that I'm not going to be able to go on the show. Can you tell me why? And he didn't answer. I said, Dennis, look, this, this is my freedom. I'm, I'm in prison serving 15 years to life for nonviolent drug offense. You know, I got like mm. 10 years in almost. Please, I need to be in the show. So he, he hands me two letters from the Whitney. Yeah. from the curator, Elizabeth Sussman. Mm -hmm. And first letter was, uh, Dear Dennis, thank you for allowing Anthony Papa uh, to be in the show. He's qu his work is quite good. And it to, to, it's, uh, Mike Kelly loved his self-portrait to be in it. And then we're going to send a handler up to get the work and be in the show. And then the next letter I read was, Dear Dennis, we're sorry that we didn't uh, 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 g tell you the startling stipulation that the person chosen to be centerpiece for Mike Kelly's Pay for Your Pleasure must be a convicted murderer. I almost fainted. I was like, what? I got who decided <laughs> that? The, 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 the it was the intellectual concept. Oh, they of wanted people the, to take a look at some work by this. Because the whole installation, yeah. Pay for Your Pleasure, tried to show right. a connection between criminal and artistic activity, right. okay. bottom line. And so. then each year that Kelly Mike Kelly showed the installation mm. at a different art capital of the world, London, Paris. The centerpiece was a local murder. And um, the, uh, the guy before me was a uh, serial killer from New York in L.A. that killed like 33 children. So it was, I was kind of shocked. I was taken aback by this. Mm. But, you know, it, the way it was explained, it was the intellectual... Uh, Interest art. that might yeah. people might have yeah. to see some semblance of what's going on in this murderer's mind, right? Is that? And this would be, yeah, okay, yeah, good. Anyway, what anyway, happened? Whatever, what right. happens is, I, I I plead with Dennis not to please let me be in the show. Right. So finally, he looks up and he slams his hand on the desk and he says, "Did you ever murder somebody?" Yeah. I says, "I says no." Mm. He says, "And you want me to lie and say that you're a convicted murderer?" <laughs> I'm not doing it. <laughs> Dennis, but you got to do it. So he gets yeah. on the phone. He calls Father Kavanaugh, this priest that yeah. was at the prison for 40 years. Yeah. And he, anytime he had to make a tough decision. It's moral Dennis, dilemma here. Dennis yeah. turned to the, the priest. Okay. And he says, he's on the phone. Father, is it, it would be, you know, okay to reveal the crime of a prisoner at Sing Sing to an outside social. He gets off the phone. Father says... I shouldn't tell. I says, oh, my God. Dennis, you got to let me do this. I need to be. Look, I'm not going to say you're a convicted murderer. So I'm looking at his desk, and I see his memo pad. And I pick it up. I said, all right, let me say it. So I write a letter to Miss Sussman. Dear Miss Sussman, as per your request, yes, wow. I'm serving a, a sen sentence for, mm. for murder. In fact, I'm serving a, a double... 215 life sentence for a double homicide. Yeah, make I it threw more an extra, interesting. I okay. threw an extra murder. Threw an extra murder. Okay. So they, feel, they were satisfied. They, you know, you they are <laughs> you are something else. You're very resourceful. Well, you have to be in prison. You have to be. And then so if you hadn't done that, I wouldn't. I you would wouldn't, be sitting here. I would. I would, I would have be been be in prison for 15 years. Interviewing somebody else here. That so so what happens is they they came. They <laughs> sent the handler up, and the show went on, and my work was shown in the Whitney Museum of American Art. And people went. But, over. Uh, but as a, a continuation, mm -hmm. and th and I write about this story and much more about my prison experience in my first book.
my first memoir when I came out of prison. I wrote a memoir, 15 to Life, How I Painted My Way to Freedom. So this story and many other good stories in there. And, and basically... So this is the, the sequel. This is the follow-up. This, this is the follow-up. This okay. is the second memoir okay. that I just wrote. It's and it's about my 20 years of freedom. You've been out 20 years. Yeah. The I first see. book was about my Got prison it. experience. Got it. Okay. So, you know, when, when, when <clears throat> the, the work showed, but what happened was this woman uh, in the town of Ossini was holding my art. And where Sing Sing is. Where Sing Sing, yeah. right. And she, she went to the, see the show, and, she, and I asked her, I was like, you know, hey, what do people say about my art? I was, you know, I couldn't go. I was in prison. It wasn't a chain long enough. Hmm. Uh, and, and she says, Andrea Miller, her name is, and she said, wow. She said, uh, you know, they admired your work. And I, she said, I said, well, wh how was it displayed? You know, could you see my name? Hmm. And she, she, she didn't say anything. I said, Do, could you see my name? There was a name tag. She said, well, they had a tag, but your name wasn't on it. All it said was, from a prisoner who committed a, a, mm -hmm. a, a murder in New York State Prison. So the and Whitney I, misrepresented it. But they didn't actually well, know that. They, yeah. they didn't get me. They, yeah. And, and, they and then I said, like, this was a wrench in my plan, like in the gears. Right. How, how, how am I going to use this? <laughs> To, right, to paint my way out of right, freedom. Right, right, right. Hmm. When, when I, I had read in, in an art magazine, whenever you have, like, a, a, a art, an artist has a big show or an exhibit or at a big museum, if they don't follow up on it, it just dies and, and be forgotten. Mm -hmm. So I said, how am I going to manipulate this into getting some press about my story to reach the ears of the governor when my name is not even known? In fact, when the reviews came out, uh, a, a, a review, a rev uh, an art critic from the New York Times wrote and said the art was like an am amazing review of the piece of art, mm. but not of the artist. And what what I did is I wrote actually the director of 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 this um, uh, 57th Street uh, School of the Arts. I forgot they closed down now. And she wrote back and she told me what you to do. You mean the Art Students League? Art Students League. Art, art student leagues, and the yeah. director of the Art well, My mother, League. who's an artist, studied as well. Really? Yeah. And, and, and um, she writes back and she tells me, look, if, you know, if you're, if you're in a, a show that has something to do with prison, you're stigmatized. Forget hmm. about it. You know, you have, when you deal with art, you do, do it for the art, for art's sake, hmm. not, you know, because hmm. you're a, a prisoner or whatever. So uh, I, you know, I, I started thinking, how am I going to make this into a piece where I could u utilize this, the, the, the Whitney Museum show? So what I did is I interviewed myself. And I went to the library, and I got uh, addre uh, addresses from all magazines of newspapers and magazines of, of journalists, and I wrote them. And I sent them this two-page interview that I interviewed myself mm. about my Whit Whitney Museum experience. About six months later, I finally got a bite from this guy from... Um, so you uh, planted the story in the which sense, Westchester yeah. newspaper. Right. And he came up with a story, uh, Mr. Popper's painting. It's a fantastic there piece. You know. wow. He didn't even, you know, he found out. He actually, Ken Valenti was his name. Yeah, he yeah. found out from someone that, that, you know, I had a lie to say I was a convicted murderer. Were you always this resourceful? Well, I mean, or was it ratcheted up it, during you, your prison It was, it was experience. totally ratcheted up. Tur okay. Because in, you are very creative and in prison, resourceful. You, you, yeah. In prison, you learn to be who you are. I, as I said, it's the most existential environment. So I found out you were I was not in only a, this artist, a, I was yeah, this PR survival guy. Survival mode. I was this media guy because now mm. that's what I do for a living. 11 years at DPA as manager of media relations. Yeah, we but, want to get into that right. now. Yeah, go so, ahead. So anyway, I, right. I, 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 I interview myself. I get this big story in this Westchester newspaper, the Gannett. And from there, I started getting interviews from across the world, Italian magazines, Law, New York Law Journal, New York Times. Wow. They wow. all came and wanted to know who was this guy who was Picasso up the river. And so then Pataki begins to see this. Eventually, he found out about it. Who is this guy? And yeah. Governor Pataki granted me 
executive clemency in 1996. I so your plan worked. It planned. It worked. I literally painted my way to freedom. Look at that. Now wow. that's the first part of the story. Okay. Because when I came out, uh, uh, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do. I got out. Freedom slapped me quickly in the face, and it was like I found out my freedom was not all that. It was like I had to work at it because I, I, all of a sudden the world changed without me. What had you been doing prior to your? I was uh, I was married. I had a seven year old daughter. Uh huh. And, you know, my wife, uh, I had a radio installation alarm business in, this, uh -huh. in the East Tremont section of the Bronx. And that was a regular joke. But when I went to prison, I Did the marriage survive? No, it didn't. No, it, okay. We got divorced. All right. And it really... So you come out and... It, it was de it devastated my family. Your my, daughter my wife, has daughter was, grown up. Yeah. She was devastated by That's the experience. Right. She still is. I, right. You know, and it, it, it just, because prison doesn't end at the prison wall. Mm -hmm. It goes beyond the wall and it touches those families, mm -hmm. the loved ones of those incarcerated. Absolutely. You know, so when, when I got the clemency, I came out, you know, I, I wanted to do something to save those I left behind. Mm -hmm. And what changed my life forever is when I went to speak at a, a Spofford Correctional Facility for youth in the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. I was invited by this writer who was doing writing program in prison. And he was a friend of Fielding Dawson, my, my writing teacher at Sing Sing. Because not only I did my art at Sing Sing, I did my writing. I, I, I discovered my, my talent as a writer also. So what college? Uh, I went to Mercy College, Mercy, Bronx yeah. Community College, right. and I got uh, New York Theological Edgeport. Seminary. Okay. And, and, and so when I came out, you know, I had, I had my degrees, I was prepared, you know, but freedom slapped, like I said, slapped me in the face. And, and, and I, I didn't know what I was going to do in my life until I went to Spot for Correctional Facility for Youth. I went in there <clears throat> with this idea I was going to talk about stress management because that's what I was doing. I was going to colleges. My professors in, invited me to speak about you know, it, it, my friend, my friend and professor, Stan, Sam Swartz. Uh, you know, said, you know, you're great at stress management. I mean, you were in prison for 12 years. So I went and sp mm. started talking about it. So I went, I went to... Uh, Spotford, I wasn't prepared what I saw. When I walked in the auditorium, it was 10 to 15 year old boys and girls right. Right. in prison garb, and it blew my mind yeah. that these would become juvenile yeah, uh, facilities. Facility. These were going to be the future residents of maximum security prison, right. the ones I was in. You didn't know that when I, you walked in? No, and, and, right. what it, and when I saw this, this 10 year old kid who was in for murder, mm. and he was waiting until he turned of age to go upstate asked me a question, which blew my mind. He said, w were you ever raped in prison? Mm -hmm. And I was like, it was a, a tough question because it was an attempt. It's actually in, in, my, in my book. Uh, um, and I answered him and it was like, all of a sudden he started clapping and then all the kids started clapping, the whole you know, 40 kids. And it was like amazing, like road to Damascus experience for me. Cause then I said to myself at that point, I need to save, even if I save one of these kids' life, prevent them from walking the road I, I have, I need to do it. So that's how I became an activist. So then I started going to the lobby. Uh, so the kids were impressed with your honesty, your integrity, your, your ability my to story. connect your story. Uh, and again, you had gotten this degree from the seminary. Right, my well. the re liberation theology. I liberation, studied. okay. If they so knew what it was about, they, they would never have the program there. I mean, it was like, <laughs> you know, how to how to challenge the principalities and powers. Well, and that was the union, be union theological, okay. somebody could do that. Yeah. Okay. Agent, become an agent, change right. and transformation. James I, Cohen, I, Black I, Liberation I, Theology, we're going to have him. I had amazing too. professors. I had this one exactly. professor yeah. who was... Um, so you who, use that work. Yeah, I and mean, and to connect with the kids and so on, right. and so you you would begin to find this meaning you were right. searching for in, right. as as freedom slapped you around. And I became an activist. I right. did it. I uh, about five weeks out, mm -hmm. uh, I did a show on C-SPAN, mm -hmm. and they contacted me, uh, a local writer who wrote a few stories. They were looking for a commentator to go on the show. The show was about Alexei de Tocqueville, who was a European aristocrat came to study America, America from France, to study right. the American penitentiary. And then he got sidetracked after a while. 1800s. 1800, and wrote a famous book, Democracy uh, in America. In America, yeah. Became a handbook politicians use it today. Absolutely. But at the time, 
his tour started with a, a tour of Sing Sing. And the, the Tocqueville. The yeah. Tocqueville. So when I went on the show, they invited me to come up. It was my 42nd uh, birthday. I went up. I took the train to Ossining. And, you know, that train cuts through the prison. And there was an escape I was involved with it, 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 in the prison. I've taught there, by the way. Really? Yeah. Uh, at, at, with Mercy. Seminary? Oh, at, Mercy College. With Mercy College. Yeah. Years and years ago. Yeah. And, 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 and there was an escape in the prison in the school building where uh, f four people from uh, my art class was involved in the escape and a guy from the law library where they cut through bars in the, in the, in the, in the bathroom of the, of the, uh, uh, in the bathroom of the prison and they got a smoke bomb at, where this kid Joe Jose came to my, came in the room and he had a slap mark on his face. He said, what, what, what happened? Where's your glasses? He said, oh, something's going down in the bathroom. And so mm -hmm. I went out and said, come on, let's go get your glasses. And all of a sudden, we're walking in, and there's smoke billowing out of the bathroom. It mm -hmm. was a homemade smoke bomb. And they, uh, all of a sudden, the, 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 the guards pulled the pin, and code blue, everybody had to return, mm -hmm. and found out there was an escape in the, in the bathroom. They cut through uh, the wire wow. fence, and they soared through the bars, and then they made a, a ladder a 20-foot ladder out of shoelaces. Mm. Prison is a very, you know, they, they, you know, when you're a lot in prison, time to think about. you get locked up, you, 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 what you, know, can you, you do, you become very good at things. So these guys, they create, you know, they get a smoke bomb, they got a, a shoelace string out of, a, a, a ladder out of shoelace strings. So they escape, they cut through the bar, the wires mm. on the tracks because the prison uh, 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 the railroad runs through That's the middle right. of the prison and then they escape. They wind up getting one guy who was waiting for a train uh, <laughs> 30, uh, in 30 minutes and then the other two, three guys, they... Metro North. They, yeah, they, they, mm. they waited for a couple of days. But during but the, uh, the lockdown right. uh, is where I, I, I painted my, my famous self-portrait uh, and many other works. Uh, you know, when I was sitting in my cell one night, I picked up the mirror. And but the connection to Tocqueville here. The connection to Tocqueville was. And the C-SPAN. When, when I, I, I went on the show, I became a commentator. And I saw the pr what they, they interviewed for three days. They went in. They took uh, film. They filmed the prison. And I went on the show of the Tocqueville. And I explained what I saw. I so see. Brian Land, Mr. C-SPAN interviewed me I see. and I talked and I debated a guy from the American Correctional Association, uh -huh. Jim Gondals, Jim Gondals, a former sheriff who was the president. And, and when I opened up the show, hmm. and you can see that show on C-SPAN, uh, it, it's, yeah. it's, it's available for free. And I actually write about it in my book, my new book. And I debated him and I opened up and I, you know, I told him what I saw was like fluff, this fluffed up image of prison because it's really tougher than that. The, you know, the food looks good, you know, but it's really not good food and it's whatever. And he actually argue, he couldn't argue with me. He said, look, I, I really can't argue with much of Papa says. I agree with him, but, you know, I represent correction officers that want to see, you know, people uh, do Pay time. Pay the price for but, their But, you know, survive behavior. imprisonment. Get an education. We were four for that. He wasn't a bad guy. We got right. along. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you know, I became an activist. Uh, Randy Credico from the William Kunstler Fund for Racial Justice. But just for uh, Tocqueville also noticed this invention, this American invention of the prisons. Right. And he and, and, he, and he, he said to himself, he said he wondered about what was going on there too. Right. right. The contradictions and. And, and, um, and he, he the thought, manipulations and he, so on. And he thought it wasn't a good, a good idea. Good idea, exactly. Some, someday yes. it was going to blow up. And, yes, and, and, and it definitely, he was right. And, was, and plus he, he made the observation, right. you know, how could you take someone and put someone in a, in a situation like that, being in prison, and, you know, would that prison be rehabilitated? Prison? Expect anything positive. Yeah, I mean, and it's true. I mean, rehabilitation is, a, is possible if you have programs available. So for somebody to want to take advantage, like myself, when I went to prison, I had college available, I got a couple of degrees, 
It changed my life. It made me right. see who I was and where I sat in society. So you want to continue that struggle for those left behind. Exactly. And you found the, the Drug Policy uh, Alliance. Alliance. Well, we started a group, Mothers of the New York Disappeared. Oh, yeah, with Randy. With Randy Credico and the William Kunstler Fund. He tracked me down. He saw me on the C-SPAN. Randy. And we st yeah. Randy, and we okay. started this group of former prisoners and, 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 and those family members of those incarcerated. Got it. And wanted to do something about fighting the drug war in New York State, the Rockefeller drug laws. Got it. Okay. The Rockefeller drug laws were enacted in 1973. And basically, the legislative intent of these drug laws was to capture the drug kingpin and to curb the drug epidemic. It didn't either. Right. It, 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 it captured low-level, nonviolent drug offenders. And like the same thing we saw in the clip before, yeah, too. I mean, that same sort of thinking is going Over on. and over again. Over and over, the same stuff. And, and basically, it was, it, was a, it was a failure. And, you know, this is why I say now with Jeff Sessions trying right. to go back and use mandatory minimum sentencing, it was a proven failure. It was a course effective. A lot of the lives were destroyed. And why go back to something in the past that's it's a That's the failure. question, why? Why I, don't we learn? I think it's basically solely because it's a prosecutorial tool that they use. Let's say if everybody was to go to trial with a drug charge, you break the system. It's all about monetary, you know, meaning. Moving the system yeah, along, moving yeah, yeah. The, yeah. the people through and, and into the system. Right, so if everybody chose to go to trial, you would break. We could do it. You break the system. So that's why he wants this tool to use to make, you know, have, like, hey, hit him with the harshest charges and then they would take a 15-year sentence instead. So it's for the needs life. of the system. Exactly. Not the people, not tool. any sort of human right. concern right. here. And, and basically what you're going to do is if you go back to the 80s again, using mandatory minimum sentencing, because New York State, Rockefeller laws, what ma is mandated by mandatory minimum sentencing laws. These were the precursor to all federal laws that occurred right. in the federal system in, in the 80s, where, where practically right. every state had a mandatory minimum sentencing law. But what that did in time... And, 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 and educate us to the fact Rockefeller was running he for wanted, president at he that wanted, time. He had presidential and he aspirations. Wanted aspirations, and he so he wanted to appear tough. tough. He and that's tough how he use this Ma these uh, Rockefeller drug laws. The drug laws to convince the country and uh, that this is the guy to vote for right. to keep us safe, and, and, which and is what these sessions. people are saying in the sessions. Yeah, they're too. doing it again. So I the mean, same whenever, stuff. Right. Whenever I meet, you know, I met a lot of politicians in my career. Right. And, you know, I, I always, I meet them. And, I, you know, when I went to Albany and lobbied and met with assemblymen and senators, you know, they had a dual view of the Rockefeller drug laws. The, uh, the open view for the public was, oh, these laws are working, we need them. Right. But behind the closed doors, Tony, I know these laws yeah. don't work, but I can't support them. If I do, I'll lose my job. So at that so what do you say to them when well, they do at that? At that point, in early in my career, when I got out in, in 1996, and I went to lobby and I, and I saw this happening, I said, we're not going to change the laws from the top down. We need to change it from the bottom up. And how do we do that? We start a street movement. And this is all in my new book. I talk about the history of the Rockefeller drug laws. Side of freedom. And what, and what really happened. Life after clemency. You know, where, you know, I mean, under Pataki was a, you know, was a right wing Republican, but he, he gave his, right. his, his clemencies and he uh, gave me my clemency. I was, I was, I was thanked him a lot, but he always danced around the issue of reform. He was an expert at dancing around the issue. As Cuomo, yeah, who was well, this more moderate Democrat, well, actually, pardoned you. If you, you take Andrew Cuomo, who just gave me a full pardon, right. and I became the first person in the history of New York State to receive uh, executive clemency from Pataki in 1996, and now a full pardon, which to me is, is total vindication, they're showing that. Which is saying, yes, the system is saying we made a mistake. Yeah, here. because the law, the, the, the sentence you got was overly harsh and you shouldn't have got it. This is what they made in this public proclamation that the laws don't work. And it, and but you're the only one. 
Well, and I'm you're the, the only one, one because you were so shrewd and and well, and creative and 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 productive. I, I did what I had to do. Yeah, do okay. So now and I'm what sure you, if you were in my shoes, you'd oh, do the same I'm not, thing. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's that's absolutely. I mean, amazing. You know, I've been I've been so, I've been told. No, I'm, I mean, was I'm an example. That. Yeah, that was. I'm an example. I'm you know you you just you're, you're an example. You know, doesn't. I mean, but look, the point is, we want other people to participate in this, well, and the system has to realize. What it's been doing is so wrong. Well, the system didn't realize that the, 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 the Rockefeller rug, drug laws were too harsh because right. in 2004, you know, after years of, of advocate going to the street with protests, we used to protest From below. On, uh, on Rockefeller Center, 15th Street, every Friday. We started out with a group. Uh, the first protest was May 25th, 1997. And we went with about 20 people. We held signs up of loved one, our loved ones. We based our group on the Argentine Madres Plaza de Mayo of Argentina, where in the 70s, the, um, uh, the government was overtaken by the military. And the only people that stood up were the mothers. They used to go to the, the, the military. Whose children were taken were away. Were taken away. They went to the military square. Because if you were subversive yes. against the military, you that disappeared. 30,000 people disappeared. And you know the the soldiers took them captive. They imprisoned the women. They had babies. They uh, took the babies. They right. killed the women. P people thrown out of plane lives. It, it was horrible. And the, and they had this military square in Argentina, and where they used to do this protest every every Friday Thursday. I think Bearing witness, right? As you did, right? In Rockefeller Center, exactly. So and and at that time. The, the military looked at the generals, oh, these are only women, what, what can they do? But that was a big mistake they because turned it around. they got international uh, media on the issue where th these people were over thrown out of power and eventually, years later, placed under arrest. The, uh, the government uh, put them in prison for the atrocities of, of the crimes they committed. At the same time, in New York State, you know, I wrote a piece, I, I write for the Huffington Post, I have my own column there, and, 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 uh, and Counterpunch, and mm -hmm. Alternate, and whoever other paper I could beg my way in, mm -hmm. uh, an op-ed, that I wrote a piece comparing the, the disappearance of, uh, in Argentina of, of those who were subversive to those that had disappeared in New York State prisons mm -hmm. that ha have, yeah. have socially mm -hmm. been, been, been sentenced to so a social death, mm -hmm. like myself. You know, and I came to that conclusion one time when my Uncle Frank Papa came to visit me and he told me he was dying of cancer. And I looked at him and I saw the same look in my eye that I was sentenced to a social death. I painted about it in a piece uh, called Frank Papa. It, actually, if people, if they're interested in seeing my artwork, they could go to my website, 15tolife.com. That's one five, the number to life.com 15 to life.com we put that up on the credits yeah, it's, too. it's on the yeah. credits and you can see my art my 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 art my activism the work i've done clips so anyway i start the group <coughs> so al lewis grandpa yeah. al my buddy grandpa al, yeah. you know was on the show many times wbai and w with uh, amy goodman democracy now when she had the morning show and um al tells me you know how tony you know how you can change these laws you got to get the asses and the masses in the street. And I'll never forget that, Al. And it was so true that when you, got, when you get people to come out, you know, before when I started my activism, there was nobody in the street. Only white papers by you know, colleges and you know, writing about yeah, the yeah, issue. Study groups. And and, but when we, what we did is we started the street movement where we started getting a human face on the issue. We put a human face on the issues of the war on drugs. Where we took, uh, for example, this 10-year-old girl whose mother was doing 20 to life, she was an addict, but they gave her 20 years in prison instead of treatment. Yeah. Instead of treatment, incarceration. And so this little girl, 10 years old, she was cute, was a button. She looked like Shirley Temple, mm -hmm. and she mm -hmm. knew she was articulate, and she spoke yeah. at her rallies. Mm -hmm. We got tremendous press, and then the first day, you know, the rally on uh, on, on May twenty fifth, nineteen ninety seven, all of New York press came, mm -hmm. and I turned to Randy. I said, "That's how we're going to change the laws by putting this human face on this issue." Mm -hmm. And in seven years, we did change the face on the issue where Rockefeller drug laws. Rockefeller drug laws. Right. Where now, 
we changed public opinion. 80% New York Times mm -hmm. wanted to change the laws. Yeah. And we did it. We changed Definitely. the, and then in 2004, 2005 were the first changes, really watered down reform. Um, Governor Andrew Cuomo at that time, before he became Attorney General, was an activist with myself. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he came, he protested with us at uh, Rockefeller, uh, 50th Street Rockefeller Center. Uh, um, and he became a you know, champion to me because he was sincere in what he wanted to do uh, to, because he knew the Rockefeller drug laws did not work. He actually, so it, it takes persistence and right. tenacity and guts, uh, which you showed in abundance. And what, what other things are you working on? with as well now reform well i mean at the drug alliance it w what i'm doing now is what are you you doing know, when now? i came so besides your painting you're still painting right yeah i'm painting except yeah, i mean it, it's, yeah sure so life what, what had now. happened was 2004 2005 we got the first changes watered down reform right then in 2009 we got historical reform with my buddy governor patterson who became a champion of the rockefeller drug laws where he was a senator from a heavily uh, affected district, Harlem. Mm -hmm. And he knew, you know, when he was senator, how bad these laws up. And even at one point, he got arrested with us. Mm -hmm. And he, when he became governor, he pushed it through. I see. And we got, he championed the Rockefeller drug law reform. I mean, there was many heroes in the movement. Assembly, uh, Aubrey, Assemblyman uh, Aubrey, who was a champion. Uh, Joe Lentil from Brooklyn. I mean, there's so many. Mm -hmm. uh, J uh, Silver. Uh, Bruno, Sheldon Silva, Joe Bruno, yeah. who most of those guys, uh, yeah. go, hopefully they don't go where I went. Or yeah, they imprisonment. had some difficulties. Yeah, but ho so. hopefully they won't wind up there. But, you know. What about today? What about, uh, who are some of the politicians, the movement activists that you well, can, with the, the, this and what are you trying to do right now, today? What, uh, what I'm doing today is when I came to DPA 11 years ago, you know, I had, went, I went, for a while, I lived in Brazil, where the two watered down reforms came, and we were at the one yard line before that, and I was so disappointed, I, I left America, and I went to Brazil. I married this Brazilian girl. Hmm. We have a son, Anthony, with her, and I, I built a studio and I painted hmm. in, in Brazil. If you see the difference in the work, of my Brazilian I work bet. and my, my work I did in prison, it's amazing. The color difference. The You're not holding your the palette is your just, hands. I studied your head I, and your hands. I right? actually painted about yeah. the life energy prana of flowers. Mm -hmm. In the work I did before as an activist, it was all about uh, capturing the environment around me. My my uh, I'd love to see it. My 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 my, my, my motif, continuous motif, was barbed wire. Manet had his haystacks, I had barbed wire. So in a lot of my work, you can see, and in, in, in this book is actually illustrated, like in the book I have 20 illustrations, and, and most of them, you'll see slabs of barbed wire on the, on the bottom. And in my paintings, you see this barbed barb wire. And sometimes the barbed wire is very tiny, where I, that was a good day for me, and some days it was gigantic slabs that looked like you know, chop your head off kind of stuff. Right. And I painted the beauty of the Hudson River juxtaposed against the pathos of imprisonment uh -huh. through the barbed wire, this beautiful Hudson River. Which you could see, of course, from surround Sing Sing. And That was the double-edged sword. Right, that, yeah. You know, that was part of the punishment. Right. After a while, yeah. I got, wow. So they, close, but so far yeah, they away. Get, and, and there you see Which, people on boats, and they're waving to us, and we're sitting in the yard, and, you know, but we're in prison. I mean, it's max security prison. So, and it was a tough, a dual yeah. time in Sing Sing. Sing Sing was, I mean, it was a, a it was place a called Times Square where you could get anything there. You could get a hit if you want on somebody, you, uh, buy drugs, uh, buy sex. Yeah. I mean, it was that uh, transvestite. So you, you've again. seen it all. And, uh, it was and, amazing. And, and, and you've kept your, it's so obvious, your incredible life energy and force. And yet, we now have these voices that are trying to return us to the past. So how does your energy manifest itself today? So what's the struggle about? How are you doing I, this? I, I come back from Brazil in the, just 2003. Just a few minutes we have, unfortunately. I, and I get a job from my buddy, Tony Newman, 
Right. He's my boss now, and he gets me a media job, and I'm there at DPA. Right. And and basically, I, I took my work to a higher level. I, I, I'm, I'm with the global drug war now. I fight the drug war around the world. You know, we're involved with the Global Commission, heads of, of countries, pre former presidents. We're involved with, with the recent trip with Carl Hart. Carl in, Hart. In uh, the Philippines. Philippines. I mean, uh, he you know, caught I, hell, right, my, from the oh, forget about it. dictator. I mean, you know what? I got death life. threats myself. Really? When I wrote about, I just wrote about the Philippine president, wow. about how he's murdering people, and mm -hmm. I got death threats myself. So I know when Carl, I was on Democracy Now!, when he told me that, I, I couldn't believe it, what he went through. He had, he had to leave the country. He was yeah. going to stay two weeks. He took five days. Yep. Right. But, you know, the, the work I do, I work with many people, with, like Carl Hart uh, and, and other activists, uh, Ethan Nadelman, the former executive director uh, of many organizations, I fight the global drug war. It's a war that I was a victim of in my capacity uh, as a prisoner of the Rockefeller drug laws. I know twofold how it works from behind bars and outside as an activist. Now under the Trump administration where uh, 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 under Sessions they want to bring back a failed drug policy that was proven wrong, didn't work under Obama, who gave uh, like 1,300 clemencies, and, you know, ch champion, uh, tried right. to change these laws, said that these uh, uh, mandatory minimum sentencing laws were poison that broke the system, which is so true. Uh, prisons burst at its seams. States couldn't have the money to incarcerate people. And those same individuals now are returning to society, and they're not prepared, these communities, to take them. So actually, the book itself, I wrote, I donated it, I'm donating it to all prison, general prison libraries in the United States. I got a United grant States. from this uh, very well-to-do uh, individual that helped me get my pardon. So every everybody in prison can read this. Yeah, can, they go to the it? library, they and read them. it. So you're you're really putting that divinity. To, oh gosh, we only have a minute to go. I, I'm trying so to. So you're, you're putting your divinity school training, and they should be giving you an honorary doctorate. I, I'm, here. I'm trying to. Uh, what do you redo, think? Yeah, give me one. Yeah, okay. why? Well, reduce this, this incarcerate, is... reduce mass incarceration. Right. One life at a time through my story to help others understand what it is the plight of an individual goes through in prison. And hopefully I can kill to continue to fight the drug war and fight people like uh, Jeff Sessions and you know, with these draconian sentences laws. People make mistakes in life. Absolutely. They need second chances. That's what I have to say. Tony. Absolutely fabulous. Thanks so much for having me on. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. And, and thank you all f uh, for watching us this week on The Radical Imagination. This is Jim Vretos. Thank you again so much, Tony. Good we'll job. see you again next week Ciao. on The Radical Imagination. Take care. But I passed. That one's fast. How long were we on? It's an hour. An hour? Well, in, in 1986, oh, when I was good. coming of age, this Ronald Reagan great. doubled yeah. down on the war on drugs that had been started by Richard Nixon in 1971. Drugs were bad, fried your brain. And drug dealers were monsters, the sole reason neighborhoods and major cities were failing. No one wanted to talk about Reaganomics and the ending of social safety nets, the defunding of schools and the loss of jobs in cities across America. Young men like me who hustled became the sole villain and drug addicts lacked moral fortitude. In the 1990s, incarceration rates in the U.S. blew up. Today, we imprison more people than any other country in the world. China, Russia, Iran, Cuba. All countries we consider autocratic and repressive. Yeah, more than them. Judges' hands were tied by tough on crime laws, and they were forced to hand out mandatory life sentences for simple possession and low-level drug sales. My home state of New York started this with Rockefeller laws. Then the feds made distinctions between people who sold powder cocaine and crack cocaine even though they were the same drug. Only difference is how you take it. And even though white people used and sold crack more than black people, somehow it was black people who went to prison. The media ignored actual data to this day. Crack is still talked about as a black problem. The NYPD raided our Brooklyn neighborhoods while Manhattan bankers openly used coke with impunity. The war on drugs exploded the U.S. prison population disproportionately locking away black and Latinos. Our prison population grew more than 900%. When the war on drugs began in 1971, our prison population was 200,000. Today it is over 2 million.
Long after the crack era ended, we continued our war on drugs. There were more than 1.5 million drug arrests in 2014. More than 80% were for possession only. Almost half were for marijuana. People are finally talking about treating addiction to harder drugs as a health crisis. But there's no compassionate language about drug dealers. Unless, of course, we're talking about places like Colorado, whose state economy got a huge boost by the above-ground marijuana industry. A few states south in Louisiana they're still handing out mandatory sentences for people who sell weed. Despite a boom in its celebrated 50 billion legal marijuana industry, most states still disproportionately hand out mandatory sentences to black and Latinos with drug cases. If you're entrepreneurial and live in one of the many states that are passing legalized laws, you may still face barriers participating in the above ground economy. Venture capitalists migrate to these states to open multi-billion dollar operations but former felons can't open a dispensary. Lots of times those felonies were drug charges, caught by poor people who sold drugs for a living, but are now prohibited from participating in one of the fastest growing economies. Got it? In states like New York, where holding marijuana is no longer grounds for arrest, police issue possession citations in black and Latino neighborhoods at a far higher rate than other neighborhoods. Yeah, Kids in Crown Heights are constantly stopped and ticketed for trees. Kids at dorms in Columbia, where rates of marijuana use are equal to or worse than those in the hood, are never targeted or ticketed. Rates of drug use are as high as they were when Nixon declared this so-called war in 1971. 45 years later, it's time to rethink our policies and laws. The war on drugs is an epic fail. 